Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce Curdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Good. I went for like a two-hour walk through the experimental experimental farm. I was excellent. Uh, we were, I, you know, it was a group of my old high school friends. We were all socially distanced from each other, but uh, we've been. Mm-hmm. It's funny, you know, we, we're we've been reaching out to each other in this last month. And it's good to have it's good to have family. It's good to have close friends, and it's good to see people. You know, you got of course we stay apart from you know, no shaking hands or anything like that. And you, but it's good just to walk and talk with people and see their faces. And I also yeah. find like it, just talking to people on Skype is really uh, can really pick you up in this time of isolation. And and Bruce, there's just no doubt, so many people are anxious and hurting and uh, oh. Underemployed, unemployed, worried about their futures, worried about their health. It is just a really difficult time. So uh, our thoughts are with with everybody. And uh, what's encouraged me doing this podcast is that uh, many people have mentioned, especially on YouTube, that this cheers them up. So if we're doing any little thing to help cheer people up, I, I'm I'm really glad about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's nice to. Remember a time when when uh, when hockey was meaningful, and imagine another time when it's going to be meaningful again. And uh, uh, there's, I mean, at any time there's stuff to uh, to talk about and consider. And uh, this is kind of it's. You know what it reminds me of, David? It reminds me of one of those weird games where something catastrophic happens during the game, and the normal rhythm of the game is disrupted. And they have to have the intermission in the before the period is over. And so everybody goes off and they fix whatever the problem was. And then they come back and they have to finish that period. And then they turn around to go the other way and they immediately pick up the next period. It happened this year in the game with the goalie fight, which wasn't that catastrophic. And it was only with a few seconds to go in the period. But other times we've seen it where it really has been catastrophic, you know, like Erie Fisher or uh, who was it this year, Jay Bowmister. Yeah. Where... You start a game and you expect the game just to go and finish and, you know, you're going to win, you're going to lose, you're going to get a betman point or everyone in 10,000 games, something completely unexpected happened and there's no result. And that's kind of where we're sitting with this entire season. Indeed. Indeed. So we continue to soldier on Bruce as if the playoffs were going to happen. And um, so, um, and the Oilers are con- continuing to soldier on as if there's going to be a next season. And they signed uh, Gaetan Haas. They have mm-hmm. Riley Shan to sign. They signed a couple players, um, three players, probably destined to play on their farm team next year. And um, I'm digging into the PK just to see if I can tease out exactly uh, how this unit improved from being one of the worst to one of the best in the NHL in one quick season. And we're going to talk about all of those things tonight. We will start tonight with uh, the signing of Gaetan Haas. And he signed a one-year deal, $925,000, I believe. And one of, you know, one of the thoughts that occurred to me, Bruce, and, and I don't know this, is if, if it's just a TV league, let's say all of the hockey leagues around the world can only be TV leagues next year, right? Mm-hmm. There may not be any money in Europe. Like, I don't know how big the TV contracts are for the right. Swiss league, the German league, the Swedish league. I like, I, I'm just guessing, but I'm guessing that they're, that they're, they're even more reliant on gate money. And I could be completely wrong about this. They, but I'm guessing they might even be more completely reliant on gate money than the NHL. So the, the prospect of playing in the NHL may never have been sweeter in some, some ways for these players. Right. Because you're going to probably, even if there's no fans, you're probably going to play next year and uh, earn a good salary where who knows what's going to happen in Europe. But, uh, but I, I could be completely wrong about that and maybe someone could fact check that and, and, and get back to us on it. And Maybe they make a lot of money in the Swiss League on TV. I don't know. Bruce, what did you think of the signing? The Gaetan Haas uh, signing, I'm in favor of it. Uh, I think they, you know, uh, just because of the nature of the, of the situation, uh, you know the uh, the off seasons are are no longer co lined like they like they used to be. Like okay, the NHL uh, put its season on pause, and up to this moment in time, they're determined they're going to pick up the season, uh, 
finish it whenever, which it sounds like they might even take it into September or even I heard October the other day, uh, finish it and then have a have an off season at the wrong time. Uh, and the market on, and that scenario is going to be quite stilted and, and different because um, there's no way that an NHL GM is going to be able to go out in October and sign some guy from Sweden or uh, Switzerland or any of these places over there because their season, they've basically they've abandoned their seasons now and their off season is just sort of prepare like normal for next season. So it's like the whole, everything's out of sync. So for that reason, the GMs, I think, have to look long and hard at the few guys that they're able to negotiate with, which is the guys on their own team that have, you know, have expiring contracts. But, you know, you can talk to those guys. And if you think they fit well enough to, uh, to cover you off, then, as Kurt Levin said in his excellent post on Sunday uh, that predicted the, uh, the Haas signing, you know, a bird in hand. Uh, it's maybe worth two in the bush because that bush is, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the NHL, the NHL's own rejected players will be on that market. But in terms of bringing in another Gaetan Haas to, to replace this one, uh, that isn't necessarily going to happen. So you got to look at the guy and say, how well does he fit? And the more I look at him, the more I think, you know, that guy fit pretty good. Uh, you know, for what he was, which was a six-figure forward, uh, you know, fourth-line center. Uh, he didn't get any special teams time, which is something that might change in his second year. Uh, but I even strength his job basically on the fourth center on this team is to go out there while Connor and Leon are getting their breath on the bench and try and make sure nothing bad happens. You know, let, let the big boys score the goals to win the game. Your job is to make sure the other guys don't get any. And Haas's defensive record was terrific. I've been looking over his numbers, and man, he's like first on the team, like on the against stats. First on the team, of course, the against per 60, Fenwick against, shots against, scoring chances against, high danger scoring chances against, expected goals against, and he's second by a few one hundredths in actual goals against. 1.74 goals the other team scored for every 60 minutes that Dayton Haas was on the ice. And the same thing with the relative stats where you compare him to the teammate. Like he's number one, number two in every single category uh, among the forwards. And you know what? He for, played for the make, against stats. For the, the against, against stats. stats. Yeah. Okay. Like the other team wasn't getting anything against the Oilers when Haas was out there. The Oilers weren't getting much either, but he was sawing off. And, you know, he played on the season, he played at even strength uh, 518 even strength minutes. And a total of 10 of those minutes were with either of McDavid or Dreisaitl. And 507 of them were with neither McDavid or Dreisaitl. Like, I mean, he's a center too, right? And his job was to get out there when they were off and, uh, and mine the store. And his, his um, uh, to me, his, I mean, his skating is the obvious thing. But I thought he was so often on the right side of the puck. And, you know, he just wouldn't get beat, beat clean. He wouldn't make stupid mistakes. And, and uh, he, you know, he lost some battles, sure. But uh, but uh, he didn't lose any because he wasn't hustling. And he didn't, uh, uh, you know, he, he didn't make dumb plays. Like, he, he always seemed to be in, in a good spot out there. And his uh, his defensive record, at least among this group of uh, forwards, I'm looking at the 10 guys who played 500 or more minutes this year. And... Uh, his his defensive side of the puck stats just shine. Of course, a lot of that's playing against the low low end players on the other team too. So you always expect to see yeah. some of that from a fourth yeah. line player. But you'd rather have a successful fourth liner than an unsuccessful one. Bruce, we've or seen a lot of fourth line centers get caved in, like <laughs> yes, Eric we Belanger. Have. We have seen a lot of fourth line players get caved in. Now, mm -hmm. and, and this is what I liked about him almost from the first game that I saw him. I thought, wow. This guy is a really smart defensive hockey player. He's always on the right side of his player, between his player and the net, right side of the puck, covering the guy in the slot, picking the guy up in the slot. That's what you. That's what I'm always worried about because it's been a chronic, chronic problem on the Edmonton Oilers, especially with McDavid, Drysaddle, Nugent Hopkins, puck watchers, all of them. God love them for their offensive ability, but they all watch the puck and they let guys creep into the slot behind them and get off great scoring chances. 
Haas from word go, that was not part of his repertoire. He covered those guys. He covered them off. He was on them. He was diligent. He was responsible. And I thought, well, if he can do that, like, why can't you other guys do that? But, but you know, it's because he's learned. He's made himself into that player. He's a more veteran player than they are. He's a very smart defensive hockey player. And according to our own work, Bruce, on scoring chances, where we're actually mm-hmm. looking, you know, not what happens to the team on the ice when he's out there, but looking for individual mistakes. He also has the lowest number of any center uh, yeah. on the Edmonton Oilers, and it's below, um, well below Drysaddle and McDavid. Uh, his defensive play was very strong. So uh, I agree with you. So he's he's dependable. You know, and the other thing is, you're going to be playing McDavid and Drysaddle. what? They're going to be playing mm-hmm. between them, uh, between all the special teams. They're going to be playing 45 minutes a game. And they're often going to be separated now on their own lines. I think that's going to be the standard going forward. You need a center who can play eight, nine, ten minutes a game and yeah. be happy doing that and give you and give you valuable minutes. Yeah. He, they, they, they must like. I don't know. I'm not around the dressing. We're not around the dressing room. We don't know these players, but they wouldn't be bringing him back if he wasn't someone they thought who could handle, accept, and excel in that role or do well in that role. And and I think he can do that. And the one thing I love about his offensive game, other than his speed, is his ability to tip hockey pucks. Um, I don't know how many goals he scored this year. We could probably check. Five. Maybe. He got five goals. And well, I no, but three, how many were oh, how many I think were tips? Three of them were on tips. Did you check our stats? Because we would have. Uh, uh, yeah. No, I'm just going off of memory, but I think three of them were by tips. Yeah. So he's got a really good hands for tipping the puck, and we've got a bunch of defensemen now, starting with Ethan Bear and Evan Bouchard coming online, who can really put the puck on net. So that might be. I could see him scoring 10 goals a year. So like you, um, you know, we're enthusiastic about all players, but Haas was a player. Um, there's some players who I like, I cheer for a little bit more than others. And I was always cheering for this guy as the year went on. I got a little less bullish on him as the year went on because he seemed to be having trouble um, winning one-on-one battles and he was getting knocked down a lot. And I was, mm-hmm. I was hoping for a breakthrough that never happened because I think right. we saw that breakthrough with Joachim Nygaard. It was coming. But but we never saw it with Haas. Maybe we'll see it next year. And and I I, I like this signing too. I think it's a, a good move. Well, both players are pr- pretty similar in the sense that you know they were they were uh, uh, sort of peak of career European pros. I think Nigard's one year younger than Haas, but they both came over on one year ELCs uh, and. Uh, would be free agent, unrestricted free agents at the end of it. And it was clearly an uh, effort by Ken Holland to address, among other needs, uh, the lack of team speed. And he brought those guys in. He also brought in Josh Archibald. As you know, all three of them have now been signed to extension. So mission accomplished in terms of picking up the team team speed. And, you know, on the depth lines, I mean, you're always going to have the fast, super fast guys on, on the first and second line. Uh, but there's no more identity line. You know, there's uh, these guys down below, at least on every line, there's one or two guys that can really motor. And both Haas and Nigard, you know, they they, they had uh, entry-level contracts of 925000 which is a maximum for an ELC, but they also had an AHL component. In Haas's case, only 70000 So when he got sent down, he got a real kick in the paycheck. You know, he went down for a couple of games. So anyway, both of them re-signed. Both of them took a cut to take their second uh, uh, check, right? Uh, Nigard dropped to 875, Haas to 915, with just a marginal drop. But he got a one-way contract. So now he can go to bed at night knowing that even if, you know, he loses a numbers game and he's, he gets sent down to Bakersfield for a month, he's going to get paid at the same rate. as if, You know, they're treating him like an NHLer. And I think he proved this year that he is an NHL caliber hockey yeah. player. That identity line, I, I still laugh oh. every time I hear that because it was the identity of the team. So that was Milan Lucic, <laughs> Kyle Brodzak, and Zach Cassian. And the identity of the team that year was two out of the three guys didn't skate well enough to play at an NHL level on the Oilers. And it couldn't have been more aptly personified oh. by that line. Um, well, those are the two guys. Yeah. Think of where Milan Lucic is. And I'll <laughs> think of, uh, of uh, I mean, obviously, Neil is the guy you're going to think of. But think of Nigard on, on the roster instead of him. And think of Haas on the roster instead of Brodziak. And now tell me that team isn't, like, twice as fast as it, it used was, to be. It was That was great. And one other factor in this signing is there's no one on the farm right now who can give the orders what Gaetan Haas says. Ryan McLeod might. 
but he clearly needs at least one more year, probably two more years. He's I, I see him as a three-year AHL player before he comes up, most likely. So he's a big, fast center. But he's got to master the defensive game. You know, in the in the games that I watched in, in Bakersfield, McLeod needs to learn how to cover people in the slot as well as Gaetan Haas does to make it in the NHL. He's got to be yeah. that 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 guy, that super conscientious, responsible, fundamentally sound defensive hockey player, Ryan McLeod, if he's going to make it in the NHL. If he is, he can be, he can make the NHL. But that's going to be a few years off, and now we have Gaetan Haas playing uh, until that time. Who's 28 years old when Ryan McLeod is 20? Correct. And so you know, I mean, he's already there, and they 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 got him to sort of provide some cover while these guys are percolating on the farm. And now they decided they need another year of that, and they may be specifically thinking of Ryan McLeod for all we know. What I do know is that you can look right through the organization if you want to find a right shot center. You got to look pretty long and hard. Uh, they had the only other one they had on the team this year who played even a tiny bit of center was Sam Gagne, who almost always played wing. All the rest of them were lefties. And, uh, you know, the guys, uh, you know, Kara, they moved him into the middle. He's a lefty. Colby Cave, they had him coming up and down from the minors, the late Colby Cave. He's a lefty. And the only righty they had in the organization that you might have thought would have a shot at an NHL job this year, Cooper Marodi. And he just never got out of the gate this year. So because he had that that security blanket and the European pro that he brought over, then he didn't have to rush Cooper Marodi into the lineup, the the manager, the coach. And then and, yeah. and Haas, you know, I mean, he's a placeholder, but he held his place. He didn't get crushed. And, and that's value. Yeah, Marodi's an uh, offensive hockey player. He's not a defensive center. Right. Like he's the only righty is all I'm saying. That, oh, that, I that's, see. That's, yeah. where the, that's where the comparison begins and ends. But they got no righties. In the system. Now that said, you want your righty to be able to win a damn face-off once in a while, and that was one of Haas's weak links. He only he, he lost four for every three that he won, and and that's uh, that needs to be improved. And he he was on uh, Bob Stoffer's Oilers now today, just before you were on, and he identified face-offs as one of the things that he uh, really wants to work on. He said it, in in Europe they they they're more straight up on face-offs. He said they do more cheating in the NHL, and he said I, you know it just took me a while and he said i lost a lot of face-offs before <laughs> before uh, sort of caught on he said i'm gonna have i'm gonna have to work on it but he recognized you know not only that he was getting drilled in the circle but why and what may what sort of things that he needs to work on so uh last time i was speculating like are there players who had kind of a iffy first year and then came on like European mm-hmm. players, and, and there are a number a of them. List. So Lear Komarov, Pierre Edward Belmar, Michael mm-hmm. Raffle, and Thomas Nosek all came over when they were like between like 24 and 28. And, and a, lot, a lot of them did not have very auspicious debuts in the uh, North American game, but they've all become useful role players. And Bob Stoffer brought, brought up Derek Ryan, um, mm-hmm. who's a Canadian who played four years imagine. in Europe. <laughs> yeah, imagine Bob bringing up Derek Ryan. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> And he's, he compared him to that player. So I, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know Ryan's game well enough to say. But he, he uh, did play in Europe into, you know, he four, came four back, years. back over here deep into his, I think he's even older than. He was 29. Yeah. yeah, he was 29. So. Anyway, yeah. So in that sense, a, a, a good comp. And he's a, a right-handed uh, centerman as well. But uh, anyway, all those guys that you name, you know, they turned into pretty solid, useful role players. You know, never none of them were like big scorers, but they were all a pain in the ass to play against. You know, and you you got to have some of that on your own team if you want to succeed in this league. I can see Haas developing that that because he was not he didn't back down. He's he's he he was getting his getting in there. He would just get knocked over sometimes. So that's something else he's got to figure out. Whereas what about uh, so right? We'll talk about Riley Shane now. So he's the um, yeah, he's the last one they got. He's one of the last ones they got assigned from this current group. And um, Jim Matheson was speculating that Rashan might get a million two. He's got a new mm-hmm. agent, or or was that what the orders were going to offer? I can't remember from Maddie's tweet. Anyway, Rich Winters is agent, and there might be some some haggling going on. Maybe some uh, maybe Winter sees Shan as a third line guy who should get paid a little bit more, like more than like he got used to get paid. In the two million dollar range, maybe the owners are wondering about that. Listen, when when they had that line of Shan, Archibald, and um, and Negard in mm-hmm. January, 
mm-hmm. they came alive. That that line was cooking. That was a third. That was a real third line in the NHL. Checking, putting up some goals now and then, cycling the puck. That was something to see. Now that kind of fell apart a little bit because of injury, and they had to move the guys around. I mean, Archibald had to play on the top line uh, for a while and, and play left wing on his offside. Sometimes yeah, but if you get those guys together again, Bruce, I'd l- I'd love to see that line together. And Riley Shane was part of it. And I, I and I never liked it with with Kara because I thought he and Kara together were too slow. Like that line just was right. too slow. Then it was again that identity line. <laughs> Two out of three guys aren't fast enough to skate. But I, Shane is, and he's a fantastic penalty killer. So oh, yes. So I, I'm hoping they can figure this out because I'd like to see him come back. Where Shane struggled was on a little bit on the defensive side of the puck, and his uh, his goals against Mark was not good, uh, and uh, uh, his line at even strength. Uh, on the other hand, he did excel in the in the uh, uh, on the penalty kill, and he, he and Archibald together were you know they were the first first team, so. On that unit, you can't look so much at the numbers because the roles are so different. If you're the first team, you're your first penalty killers. A, you're always starting in your own end of the ice, and B, you're almost always starting and facing the other team's first unit power play. Whereas this, when you finally get the puck out and you make your change, the second second penalty kill team rolls over the boards with the puck behind the other team's net and them starting to break out. And, you know, you've already got a little bit of a built-in advantage to killing the rest of the penalty and so the the first unit is crucially important and uh they uh they really delivered the goods and Shane. the other th- oh sorry go ahead go the other ahead. thing he did was uh he was super important for the oilers in the face-off circle uh he took uh, uh second most face-offs on the team behind of course dry uh but well ahead of mcdavid and he took, uh, he won 49% of his draws, and you think, well, that's only so-so. But, you know, uh, at uh, at even strength, he was up over 50, I think 51%. And uh, uh, on the penalty kill, which he took 209 face-offs uh, shorthanded, and uh, I think eight, I got the wrong thing open here, just give me half a shake. There's two face-off. Uh, they think it's so important. They have two different face-off sites on the NHL's website. Yeah, he took 210 shorthanded face-offs, nine power play face-offs. And that's a case where the uh, uh, the penalty-killing team's at a double disadvantage because the, 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 the way they put the sticks down is meant to uh, favor the team in the attacking zone, which is where the power play starts. And with four against five, you get way more help from the winger. Uh, on the power play team than you do. So uh, with Shane, I mean, here's it's pretty typical result. 51.7% at even strength, 55.5 on the power play, but only 41 on the shorthand. And you think, well, that stinks, but uh, that that's pretty normal. That a player, you know, a normal player would be 50, 55, 45 kind of thing. And so he, but because he took, uh, literally four times as many face-offs in his own zone that he took in the offensive zone. And, you know, literally 20-plus times as many shorthanded as power play. That 49% is a good 49%. You know, he's he's actually above what you would expect. And he took, a, you know, a lot of heavy defensive zone uh, face-off work. So, well, Riley, Sh- Riley Shane, um, hmm? in terms of, in terms of our work, Bruce, where he made the fewest number of, of major mistakes on grade A chances against mm-hmm. of any Oilers player on the PK wow. on, on a rate. On the so he, on the, excuse me, on the penalty kill. Yeah. He was the best. He was like he was the least likely guy to make a mistake. You could count on him to, to out there to to not allow those cross seam passes, and that was a huge trigger uh, for the Oilers' par, p- penalty kill success. So um, you know that as we've said, they cut the goals against in half season to season. And Riley Shane was obviously a big part of that. So um, I I haven't done enough research to figure out what he should get paid. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't have a number in mind, but uh, I'm hoping they, I'm hoping they sign him for a one year deal. Maybe not Mm -hmm. two. like, he looks like the kind of player who might work best on a one year deal. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) But I do hope they bring him back. 
if I'm his agent, I'm pointing to Josh Archibald's contract and saying, well, you know, they were a tag team and Archibald got two years, 1.5 million. That's what we want. And as he pointed out earlier, I mean, Shane came off for three years in a row where he got paid a little north of two million. So he really took a haircut this year. You know, he wound up losing the game of musical chairs and not having a job all summer and winding up having to take a low ball offer. And he might say, well, I can't took the low ball offer. I came in and proved myself the way Alex Chason did last year. Now I expect to get paid. And I mean, if he's got a new agent, who knows where the tug of war goes. To me, the signing of Gaetan Haas this week is kind of a shot across the bow of the Shane camp saying, OK, yeah. we already got the position covered now. We got Kara. We got, you know, we got all the top guys under contract. The only center left from this team that's not signed is is you. And I mean, we found you in September last year. We'll probably find somebody else, uh, you know, next summer if need be. And. You know, that, that that would get just be a haggling spot. And, you know, I don't think like 1.2 million, that doesn't sound like off the wall. What, you know, if he if he's asked for 2 million again, well, I'm not sure it's there. But uh, he's, you know, he's got a half decent case. And I think the team has a half decent case. Well, you're a bottom six forward. We got to pay you like one. I think he's as valuable a player as Josh Archibald. Um, mm-hmm. I think that you can make a case that, that he should get the same amount of money. Some ways he's because he's a center. He's he might be. You could argue he's more valuable because it's harder to find centers than it is to find wingers. Alrighty, uh, what's our next topic, Bruce? Oh, the signings. Let's talk about yeah, your post. three guys signed today. Yeah. yeah. Well, Theodore Lindstrom is certainly the player of uh, of most interest, and this is where our. Um, I guess his name's been kicking around for a while. Let's 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 be fair. But our colleague Kurt Levins in his Sunday column in which he nailed the signing of Gaetan Haas and he nailed the impending one year extension of the uh, uh, of the NHL's agreements with leagues around the globe and that was announced on Tuesday. And then on on Wednesday, here we are. Here's a quote straight from Kurt's post on Sunday. And uh, he says, the order scouting staff's been busy as the club tries to shake every tree for players in their cap strap state. One to keep an eye on would be Swede Theodore Lenstrom. I'm interested to hear how he pronounces Theodore. Lenstrom, a 25-year-old offensive-minded left-shot D-man. He's a terrific skater with an effective shot. Agreements between your NHL and European leagues have expired, but logic is these unusual circumstances dictate a one-year renewal is likely. Yeah, so... That happened right after as well. So Kurt's column, he wrote three things on Sunday that have already happened, and this is Wednesday. So <laughs> you nailed that one, Kurt. Good work by Kurt. So, so Bruce, these defensemen, sometimes they turn into Michael Kempney, and sometimes they turn into uh, Joel Parison. So it, it, and, and more often than not, they turn into Joel Parison, uh, who's, I think, heading back to Sweden now. Mm-hmm. And the, the thing that I liked about Lenstrom was the, the one thing that I, I, I read was he's a fantastic skater. Yeah. I so that, that, that gives you a chance to play in the NHL if you're a fantastic skater. And um, so he's, you know, mid-career, mid-20s, uh, never put up a ton of points in the Swedish league, but um, can, can really skate. Hey, that kind of player can be useful to a team. And certainly useful to the Bakersfield Condors next year because they're down some defense and they needed they needed some veteran help, and they look like they they just got some. Yeah, he signed a little bit of a strange contract to me. Like he did, he signed the same one Haas did, nine twenty five, which is like the the ELC maximum, but only seventy thousand in the AHL. And and if he's as apt to wind up in the AHL as as Scuttlebutt has it then I'm not sure he wouldn't be doing better than that in the Swedish league, but I guess he wants to see what he can do over here. And maybe he just has supreme confidence that he's just going to come in and make the team or, you know, in a couple months, he's going to make the team or whatever. But uh, uh, if he winds up down in Bakersfield, that's, you know, that's pretty cheap uh, uh, to get a, to get an experienced player like a, you know, 25 year old guy like him. And every report I heard Mike Zanier was quoted on, uh, Stoffer show today talked about how explosive a skater he is and how 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 good he is at escaping the first four checker and you know shaking the guy and then making his pass which is a key play for you know a puck moving d-man 
And yeah. the elite, the elite prospect scouting report says Lentz was an offensive defenseman who moves quickly on the ice. Great skater. That's an entire sentence. Great skater. Love to read that. Has a good shot and is fairly good at penalties. I don't know if that means shootout, power play, exactly penalty. Must be, must be penalty penalties. kill. On the downside, he needs to work on his defensive game and improve his positioning in order to reach his potential as a top defender. So I call him a work in progress. There's no no realistic way to think he's going to come in and make the team. I mean, last year there was a little more buzz about Joel Pearson and an obvious opening that the Oilers desperately needed a, a right shot puck moving defenseman. And, and uh, just to, to face the facts, Joel Pearson had his lunch eaten by Ethan Bear. And he did not win, you know, that battle. Bear was a younger player and under club control, and and they wound up moving on from Joel Pearson. So one way or another, I mean, he wasn't going to come back, so they are going to have to replace him. So now they've brought in this Lenstone, and, and at minimum, he's going to help Bakersfield Ponders. And decent numbers. Like, he's always a plus player. I like that, even though I know there's all this stuff about plus minus. When a guy puts up a plus every year after year after year, either he's on just a powerhouse team and he's just sort of rising with the tide, uh, or if he's moving around, which is this is on three different teams in two different leagues, plus 11, plus 14, plus 8, plus 8, plus 9. That's his last five years in sort of 50-game seasons. You know, that's that's an outscoring player. So we'll see if he can bring that across. And if he, if he does, then he becomes a, a more interesting player. Uh, uh, prospect in the longer term. One thing which I didn't write about today, which is important, is that he's young enough that when his contract expires in one year, this club will still have RFA rights on him. So if he's showing anything, uh, he's Edmonton's property for at least uh, one additional season. Bruce, the Oilers also signed uh, Brad Malone and uh, Luke Esposito to minor league contracts. Mm-hmm. I really like Luke Esposito as a mm-hmm. minor league hockey player. It'd be like a, the longest of long shots. They, they signed AHL contracts, but the longest of long shots for Luke Esposito to ever make the NHL. He's not that big. He's not that fast. But man, he he hustles and he is a tough, nasty hockey player. He throws hits out there. He he levels players. I like his work ethic. Brad Malone is kind of a NHL tweener. Like he he he's it, at times he's just killed it at the, in the AHL level because he's such a strong two way player at that level. But his skating, Bruce, is not, it's just not there for the NHL. And he's struggled every time he's tried to make it in the NHL because of that. He just doesn't have the foot speed to make it. But he's a veteran player. I think he'll probably be about 30 next year, I'm guessing. And uh, I don't have it right in front of me. He, yeah, he's and, 30 um, now. So he, he's, he'll help out that group of centers. He'll be a veteran presence down there helping Marodi, McLeod, um, whoever else is at center. And... Um, so a good a good veteran player to help the young players down there. I like both those signings. I'd love mm-hmm. to see Esposito get a game in the NHL because he really is a hustling and, and gritty hockey player. That would be a, a, a fun thing to happen. I'd like to see Brad Malone get a game in the NHL under these circumstances only. Uh, this year, while he's still under an NHL contract, that they pick up hockey again. And they carry probably 28-man team with a big taxi squad because there's not going to be a lot of room for movement. And the Oilers are home and cooled out for game 82 or game 78 or 76 or whatever it is. And Brad Malone, who's sitting on 199 NHL games, gets a tip of the hat from the organization. It says, just to... Just because. Now, that's, that's a perfect world, which this isn't, but that would be nice. But it's actually a, a, a really a telling thing that uh, Brad Malone, after three years in the organization uh, on an NHL, AHL deal that put him on the 50-man list, has now agreed to take an AHL-only contract, which, you know, it's a huge concession on the part of the player, which basically admitting the NHL dream is, is done. And yet... The team likes him, and he obviously likes Bakerfield and the situation up there that he accepted their contract. I'd be very interested to know, uh, just for interest's sake, what are they paying this guy? He was on. He's one of those guys he had that you see these contracts all the time with the older veteran AHL players. NHL minimum, but a real nice 
stipend in the, on the AHL portion of the deal. You know, not a full one way, but in his case, he was two hundred seventy five grand for playing in the AHL. Like that's pretty good money. And so yeah. I'd be interested to see how much of the Bakersfield team, but if, because it's not an NHL contract, those details will probably won't be released. But uh, uh, he's um, uh, he's kind of a core player for them. He's kind of a blood and guts guy, eh? and he's a yeah. penalty killer. He just like all situations, plays center, can play up and down the lineup, and he's a he's a classic tweener. He never did anything for the Oilers really in his call ups, but uh, in the NHL he's been fine. Big tough player. And you know what, Bruce? I could see them having fairly yes. large taxi squads mm -hmm. in yes. the NHL because let, let's say someone, let's say they're in quarantine. Let's say yeah. a couple of players get the uh, get the the COVID, oh, and uh, yeah. and then they they might need to then test everybody, and they might have some players out, and so they need to to have more players than normal, who mm -hmm. are who are going to come in and fill in. So I could see. Josh Curry, Tyler Benson, Evan Bouchard, Brad Malone, Joe Gambardella, uh, Cooper Marodi, uh, uh, well, William Loggison, obviously, maybe even Keegan Lowe, and maybe a goalie, mm -hmm. all being on kind of a taxi squad, just just mm -hmm. kind of an insurance squad who's in quarantine just just in case group, and they might even just practice on their like they might even be separate from the practicing for the rest of the team like who knows what it's what it's going to be like the black yeah. aces try a uh, practice at uh, 6 30 on friday morning <laughs> so yeah exactly but yeah so I, we'll I think yeah i've been thinking about that and i haven't heard any talk about it but i've been thinking you know if they're going to play playoffs and they're going to be playing under this lockdown you know injuries happen in the playoffs i'll bet they'll be carrying some pretty healthy it won't be any 23 man roster let's put it that way everybody will have an extra goalie We'll have an extra couple of D-men, three or four forwards. You know, like there'll there'll be a, a healthy um, depth component of a guys at least are available that they can bring in if something happens, right? Yeah. So and Brad Malone would be one of those guys on, on the Oilers at a certain point. So this year, not next year. Next year he's not on an NHL deal. All right, let's talk about the PK, Bruce. And um, right. so I'm going to be writing a post, another post on that. And we're look, we're trying to figure out why the Oilers PK and did so much better this year than last year. And you know what? And again, I'm going to. This is a this is an obvious thing. Riley Shane was the best penalty killer on the Oilers this year, um, in terms of our the work that we did. He, he made the right. fewest fewest number of mistakes uh, per minute for PK minute and. Um, you know, he and, and Archibald, Nugent Hopkins did a really good job of this. And, and you know, Jujar Kara has gotten a lot of criticism from, from me and others um, for his even strength play. But on the penalty kill, Jujar Kara was a really strong hockey player this year. And um, he and Nugent Hopkins were a, a solid second pairing. So, you know, they had, they, they, they'd throw out Archibald, Shea, and Nuge, Kara, and, and uh, you know, Dreisaitl would get, get in the mix as well now and then. Every single player, Bruce, you know, because they allowed so many fewer goals against this year on the PK, you know, right. one thing you notice is right down the list, this year compared to last, well, everyone's rate of, of being on the ice for goals against is dramatically lower this year. And they and they also um, allowed, you know, they are also on the ice for uh, fewer high danger chances against this year. Every single player, like the players who came back, Larson, Nugent Hopkins, uh, Nurse, Dreisaitl, Clefbaum. They are all on the ice for fewer high danger chances against and fewer uh, goals against. Mm -hmm. So um, just, again, you know, the, the obvious things are they, they were able to, as a unit, uh, cut down on the cross scene passes. And, um, and it just, it really paid off. I think that attention to detail, good sticks, not over committing, like knowing when to commit, knowing when not to commit, uh, paid off. I'd love to uh, to pick some of the brains of the older players about this actually and find out what because it's not usually yeah. something that's dug into in depth like what mm -hmm. is uh, I, I haven't read any interviews that have satisfied that right. that answered that question like what what did you do differently this year I'd love to know that from, from their yeah. perspective. Yeah, and that was a that was a a fresh slate. Unlike the power play that kept their you know the, all their primary players and their and their special teams coach, the penalty kill they changed out the coach, uh, the defensive coach. They they brought in two uh, first line PKers up front. Of course, one of the goalies was new. 
so they were really you know uh, piecing together a, a new uh, a new unit there and the philosophy uh whatever it was um uh you know clearly had success i mean one of the things they did even on the penalty kill that was different was they used that uh that release pass right into the center of the ice in front of their own net the guy was yes. open and then he'd clear it down yeah. um but uh that was more an issue at, at even strength but they they uh they moved the puck in their own end a little bit more confidently and of course on the pk you just got to get somebody with enough time to rifle it down the ice and you're golden and they uh it was like a totally different unit from a couple of years ago it's it's interesting brodziak and reader who, who were kind of replaced by um Shea and Archibald, they, they weren't terrible penalty killers, mm -hmm. though. They were actually pretty mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's not like they were horrible in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, I think they did move out some, you know, I'm not going to dwell on Zach Cassian again because I keep bringing that up, but I think they did move out a couple players who were struggling on the PK. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, again, I, I would love to, to talk to someone like Jim Playfair and find out exactly what the right. difference was, what, other, what strategies they were using. The other thing I'm going to suggest that you that you might want to look up while you're doing this uh, PK thing is how many grade B uh, goals were allowed on the penalty kill by the goalies. I'm 100% convinced that this year's number is way lower than last year. And it might be interesting to look, at, look back through the last couple of years of our stats where we do isolate penalty kill and we do single out grade B goalies goals and usually blame the goalies. And, and just to mind, I just don't remember too many times going, oh, crap, they did everything right. And then the goalies sieved that one in from the boards. You know, there just wasn't so much of that. And in the past, that used to drive me nuts. Talbot would let something in from from middle of nowhere, you know, it would float through a pile of bodies and find a corner, hit a skate and bounce in. Or, you know, and, and, you know, I guess that wouldn't even be a B chance. But it, just too many ones where you thought... We just needed a save there, and we didn't get it. And this year, I just don't recall having that frustration. Same on the issue with kill. yeah, same issue with Koskinen and Bruce. Like mm -hmm. last year compared to this year, I remember Vancouver used to eat him alive. Like mm -hmm. Peterson would pick that glove spot a, a couple times for goals from forty uh, feet, and Koskinen, but he didn't do that. Koskinen was didn't allow that goal. I was kept expecting to see that goal against, and he just he didn't let that. How many times did Koskinen get beat high glove side this year? Not that many times. A lot fewer than last year. Yeah, he just good for I'm him. Not, like I'm thinking specific to the penalty kill. We'll find that yeah. goal, the goalies yeah. just didn't give away any freebies on the penalty kill. And, and I will probably a chunk of the percentage improvement right there. Yeah, definitely. And I will. I should probably have done that first because it's probably the oh. most obvious thing to look at. But uh, I'm just kind of. Uh, taking a scatter shot that's, approach, I that's guess. It's part four or six, you know, whatever, when you get to it. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's no rush. We got all, we, got we don't know we when got hockey's time. gone. So we could do like a 30-part series, the mystery of the Oilers penalty kill. How do they get so much better? Maybe, and maybe like maybe it's just like puck luck is a huge that's... part of it. <laughs> so well, you know, it's, it's probably it a is part, part of it, it, for sure. It is definitely part and of just it. Just other guys not making those seeing eye shots, you know, and some of that's just, you know, a single event where some guy just makes a perfect shot. And... If you were a real fanatic, and I think you suggested this, you could just look at the goals uh, year to year, look at all, and that probably wouldn't take that long, actually. Maybe I'll even do that. Just just one out, you know. Take more than a month. <laughs> it, well, well, it would, uh, you can you can go to NHL.com and quickly find yeah. it. It would, take, oh, a, it would take three or four hours. It would take time, yeah. Not, yeah. not, not a huge, huge... Because then you, because when you go to hlcon.com to watch the goals, you got to watch their their ads. Like oh. they, they play every time, every every goal you watch, you got to watch an ad. So that's always a little bit of a pain in the butt. But uh, you know, we're dedicated, Bruce. We're this is the cult of hockey. It's it is a cult, right? So it's mm -hmm. not like we we are kind of zealots and fanatics here. We're not like normal fans. We're we're a little bit nuts. So that's the kind of thing that I might do. Okay. Well, it's, uh, it, it would probably be instructive. I'll, I'll leave it there. All right. Well, now, now you're, you're right <laughs> on here. Okay. Well, I think uh, I think we've covered it tonight, Bruce. Is there anything else on our list? Uh, no, we covered all those signings, right? Yeah. And uh, we've got, I mean, 
Bakersfield Condors are, are in a lot more secure position today than they were yesterday. For oh, sure. Uh, and I think the Edmonton Oilers are in a slightly more more secure state than they were the day before yesterday. You know, they got one of those centers signed, and now they've got one left that they have to decide on and either get them done or get them replaced. Um, but uh, uh, just getting back to business as usual you know the last contract that was signed was early march i think it was josh archibald and then once we hit the 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 pause there was nothing in the way of contracts other than i guess um raphael lavois was signed you know to a standard elc and otherwise nothing was going on for quite a number of weeks and i thought holland might be ticking off a few of these boxes well now he's getting back to that and uh Clearly, he's got a priority list, and my guess is Riley Shane uh, might be next. Uh, if they are going to sign him, it might happen relatively soon. And then, of course, the big decisions are Mike Smith and uh, how to go about uh, securing Ethan Bear uh, for the intermediate and long term. So you're going to be digging into that kind of stuff. You bet. Yeah, yeah we're going to be doing our player reviews, and uh, I think we're going to start by looking at the... Uh, uh, at the various free agents and the case they made for themselves to uh, uh, continue their careers in Edmonton. It's interesting. I hadn't expected Malone to be re-signed. They have uh, McLeod at center. Uh, who do they got? Let me just see. Here. Marody. Uh, Marody, McLeod, Esposito, who, who can play center. Yep. Liam Folks, mm -hmm. I think oh, he's yeah. a college player, and Devin Brasso, who's, who's a little bit more higher caliber, bigger name college mm -hmm. player. But you can see... You can see they they really they just you, need you know players. I mean, Malone can play wing too, right? If if they yeah. if they're flush at center, they just move the guy around. He can play third line. He can play first yeah. line. Maybe. I, That's I the see, beauty of yeah. that guy. He'll step in and play on the third line and and really anchor. He, you know, he'll they'll put him in tough minute spots. They'll they'll put him in all the spots that nobody else you know that could eat alive other players, and and he he'll just have to suck it up. But that'll mm -hmm. help both Marodi and McLeod and uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, and, so. the, and the the fact that he's on the AHL deal and not uh, on that 50-man list anymore, thats I consider that to be kind of a win for the Oilers. They were able to retain the player, but in the right spot and without uh, occupying. It's that 50-man list. They, they, have to, they have to cull that down a little bit. If you can cull the list down without losing the player, well, you've done all right. Indeed. All righty. Thanks for talking tonight, Bruce. Hey, yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.